All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming to our Carbon Nation Conversations event with Peter Bick and a host of experts in the soil and agricultural fields. Um, this is our first Global Institute of Sustainability event of the semester. We're very excited. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Leslie Forst. I'm the events coordinator for the Global Institute of Sustainability. We have a really packed schedule of events this spring, and I wanted to mention a few that are coming up next week before we get started. On January 21st, we have Professor Nilsa Bosque Perez. She'll be discussing case studies from her research on socio-ecological systems in Costa Rica. That's at 12 p.m. in this room. Um, on January 22nd, we have Lindsay Kincaid. She's an associate faculty member at the ASU School of Design, and she'll be hosting an interactive lecture and workshop on paper prototyping our radical bike futures. So that'll be really exciting. I hope you can join us. That's also at 12 p.m. in this room. On January 23rd, we have two events. At lunchtime in this room, we have JC Chitwood, the environmental strategy manager from Toyota. She'll be discussing sustainability from an automaker's perspective. And then in the evening, uh, we're hosting a free film screening in partnership with the School of Life Sciences. Um, and the film is Green Fire, Aldo Leopold, and the Land Ethic of Our Time. That'll be in the Marston Theater at 5.30 p.m. Um, in ISTV 4 building. For more info on any of our events and to RSVP, please visit us at our website at sustainability.asu.edu slash events. And now I'm going to introduce Professor Peter Bick, who's hosting today's conversation. And Peter will introduce all of our special guests. Peter is a professor of practice at the School of Sustainability and at the Cronkite School of Journalism. He's also the director and producer of the film Carbon Nation, a film that focuses on climate change solutions. Peter, take it away. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Uh, it's real great to have everybody here. We we didn't know if we'd get anybody being so close to the first day of semester, but uh, the team that puts this on, Lauren and Leslie, they know how to do it, and they also know how to feed people, so <laughs> glad. And there is a linkage. And there is a linkage, <laughs> no question about it. So, so I'm going to go ahead and sit down. What we have here is um, a team of people that could really make an effect on, on climate and, and, and really make an effect on getting our soils healthy. And we've just had a day and a half long conversation ourselves about some research that we want to do. And I'm just the luckiest guy that I was able to be able to bring these folks here. Um, we're at the Global Institute of Sustainability. There's a Walton Initiative here. And they funded this travel expense to get everybody here. So we said, we're going to do this private conversation. Why don't we do a public one as well? So this is Car Carbon Nation conversation number four. Usually they're one on one. This one is uh, 10 on 1, so it's a little <laughs> bit different. Um, on the far end is Christine Jones from Australia, and she's uh, a, a soil carbon pioneer. Uh, coming this way is Russ Conser, who is an entrepreneur, independent thinker, worked at Shell for 30 years, and now is uh, unshackled and free. And then <laughs> Wendy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have a problem with your last name, Tahuri. 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 And Wendy is right now uh, working at, at USDA, but she's about to go off and, and do some private work. She is a mycorrhizal fungi specialist. And then we got Mike Lehman, who is at AS, uh, USDA ARS, and he too is a, a soil microbe specialist. And then we've got Urs Kruter, yeah. awesome, from Texas A&M. He's a social uh, scientist, economist. And then we've got uh, Rebecca Riles, a.k.a. Becca Riles. Uh, I met her when she was at UC Berkeley during her PhD. She's now postdoc at Brown and moving around. And she's a specialist, well, what would you say? Um, I call myself a deep ecologist. Okay, oh, I just realized. We've got to pass this around. So go ahead, say that again. So I'll try to do questioning so that the mic can get around. We had a second mic. I call yeah. myself an ecosystem ecologist and soil biogeochemist, so I study the way that nutrients move through the ecosystem. Okay, cool. And then over here is David Johnson from New Mexico State University. He too is a soil microbiologist specialist, and um, he's doing some work that's mind-blowing. And then we've got uh, <coughs> Steve, Steve Applebaum. Um, Steve, what's the name of your company? Uh, Applied Ecological Services. And Steve's a scientist, and he's working on uh, restoration of all sorts of different type of land mass. He's just been at a conference about restoring, uh, restoring the, the Mississippi Delta. And then we've got Jason Roundtree from Michigan State University, who is a, you are a rancher, even though you're using a test plot to do it with Michigan State, and, and you're also looking at the methane piece of cattle. And then we've got um, uh, um, 
I'm having a... Richard Teague. Thank you, man. I knew it was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. So then we have Richard Teague from Texas A&M University, who is pretty much, the, in my mind, one of, let's just say one of, the leading scientists working with ranchers who are dealing with holistic management, trying to, to graze in a way that's a positive for the, for the soil rather than a negative. And so this is the team we've got, and I'm going to have a lot of Q&A for everybody, but I thought we'd just uh, open it up. Uh, let's start with you, Richard. Richard has to leave first to get his plane, then Jason has to leave second to get his plane, thus this, this uh, positioning. So Richard, what was the moment that you first realized that, that climate change was a problem and that carbon was a part of that? Did you have an aha moment? No, because my history going back to when I was a teenager, um, working with people to improve the land involved improving soil carbon for hydrology related uh, purposes, which translated into extra productivity and earning capacity. So as soon as uh, climate change became a discussion topic, um, if you've got soil, in, uh, if you're increasing soil carbon, you are pulling it out of the air, so this is a potential plus um, to mitigate. Talk about the connection between pulling carbon out of the air and, and getting better water retention in the soil. Make that connection. The more carbon you have in the soil, the greater the water holding capacity. But in order to get to the point where you it, plant productivity and decreasing bare ground, which uh, enhances loss of carbon from the soil, as soon as you decrease bare ground and increase plant productivity, you are adding carbon to the soil. And that enhances both the getting the water, the rainfall into the ground. If you've got a high percentage of bare ground, you're losing, you're only getting 25% of your rainfall into the soil. Whereas if you've got good plant cover, you can get 80 plus percent of the rainfall into the Just soil. Just simply how much rain is soaking into the system and how much rain is washing off. So that means extra plant productivity, which means greater amount of carbon in the soil. And, and Steve, talk about drought resilience and flood situations with that scenario we just talked about. Well, according to the, the USDA, uh, soil organic carbon levels on average in the United States have been depleted 60 to 90 percent. And at the same time, increasing flood frequencies, the rare event floods that are supposed to happen, have a 1 percent chance of happening in any given year or happening you know, every other year now. Uh, I live in Wisconsin. We've had nine, uh, let's see, we've had seven 100 to 500 year flood events on the Mississippi River and the Wisconsin River in the past nine years. So uh, one of the problems here is uh, the engineering solutions, putting dams in, more reservoirs, more detention basins, uh, are, are really symptomatic of these large scale changes, but not, not addressing the large scale problems of declining soil health, soil carbon depletion, are you and so forth. Are you suggesting that if there was a lot more carbon in that soil, healthier carbon, that those floods wouldn't have been as extreme? Uh, I exactly. Not all floods uh, can't generalize. Uh, antecedent conditions, you know, if the water, if the soil is already completely saturated, then there's no additional water holding capacity mm -hmm. and it'll run off. But if you have more carbon in the soil, more organic matter that's sponge-like, and more productivity in plant material covering that ground rather than bare soil, both the water holding capacity of the soil and the impediment to water's movement from the land mm -hmm. are increased, which essentially keeps water on the land, increases the infiltration that Richard just talked about, yeah. uh, and, and keeps water around so that it evaporates and evapotranspires rather than running off. Uh, and, and the percentages start to balance on what infiltrates. And so the, the whole idea of, Christine, I'm heading to you, so I know you're eating. Let's uh, go this way. The whole idea of, of having plant cover also cools the soil, which creates a situation where you have less evaporation anyway. So it's this great virtuous cycle versus the other way around. So Christine, how do you get carbon into the soil? What are the ways we were talking about some of the most to get carbon into the soil? Well, first of all, we have to uh, fix it from the atmosphere. So it's in the atmosphere as a gas, which I'm sure you're all very well aware of. We're hearing about it every day, CO2 levels in the atmosphere. But it's in a different form. It's in a solid form in the soil. So the intermediary or the conduit between the atmosphere and the soil is a plant, which can fix that CO2 and turn it into sugar. So we talk about, um, about fixing carbon dioxide 
transforming it into sugars, moving it through the plant, out through the root system and into the soil. And in order for that to happen, for that carbon to move out of the plant and into the soil in liquid form, we need to have what we call a microbial bridge, which is a symbiotic relationship between that plant and the biology in the soil, or more specifically the microbiology in the soil. And unfortunately, the way most land is managed now, or the way a lot of land is managed now, is that microbial bridge is blown, to put it bluntly, by the use of agrochemicals that interfere with the biological processes in the soil and actually prevent the plant <coughs> from moving that carbon out into the soil profile where it can become uh, a stable compound that aggregates soil particles into little lumps so that that makes the soil, uh, when the soil is well aggregated it means it's what you probably call friable or or porous, or if you think of your garden soil where you've used compost or you've mulched it and it's nice and soft, you can actually dig a hole with your hand instead of needing to use a spade. Well, that's what we call well aggregated soil. On our farmland, we see that soils have become more like concrete. And the reason that they're compacted <coughs> and they're no longer aggregated is because they don't have the biological activity to, to bind the soil particles together. But that biology can't be there unless we have a plant that's photosynthesizing and fixing carbon. So carbon is really so essential for all of the things that we think ecosystems, all the services that they perform naturally, yes they do, uh, but they need carbon to drive, it's the energy that drives that system. So what we're thinking of as being a problem in the atmosphere actually is an asset for our soils, provided we have this link. And the link between the atmosphere and the soil is plants. So the reason that we've been talking about uh, grazing management, for example, is to ensure that there is uh, as little bare ground as possible and as much uh, cover or living cover as possible, but also we need to manage those plants so that they're actively photosynthesizing. In other words, fixing carbon. Cool. Christine, can you hand it to, to Wendy? Um, so when that carbon is going into the soil and the plant's happy, why is the plant happy and why is the carbon going into the soil? I hope I'm asking you the question to lead you to your, to your specialty. Yes, so plants interact with microbes and microbes play a major role in providing nutrients to plants. So if you put a plant in a sterile environment, it won't do nearly as well and most plants won't, do, won't survive that at all. They, they're, they evolved to work with microbes. So they send sugars out of their roots so that microbes will come to them and grow in those sugars and proliferate. And then as those microbes, which their little bodies, just like our bodies, also contain carbon, and there are, are just tons of microbes in soil. Soil is completely alive. And these organisms... Would you say healthy soil is completely alive? Healthy soil, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, healthy soil is more alive than, than certainly uh, degraded soil. And these organisms all play a role. And these organisms not only become part of the carbon cycle, but there's a particular orga organism that is a keystone species in soil. It's called mycorrhizal fungi, and that's my special area of expertise. And they mediate between some of these other communities. When you have my more mycorrhizal fungi, you have more bacteria, more everything is going on, uh, more fungivores and the things that eat those, more predators. The whole ecosystem kind of goes around this because their hyphae are a highway to that resource, the plant roots. Soil is porous, so if you're the size of a bacteria and you're trying to reach that plant and that resource, you're you know swimming along, and you've got to go around each particle, you're never going to get there in your lifespan. You know? You're going to die of old age. Um, so you've got to jump on the hyphal highway, and they're coated with beneficial organisms. They promote more beneficial organisms. They increase plant nutrient efficiency. They affect grazers. They affect insects that are above the ground uh, eating the plant. They, they have an impact on every aspect of that plant's physiology. And they're an, an incredibly important link to making our ecosystems and our agricultural systems efficient. And, and Mike, uh, just to take it down further, uh, what, what's the work you're doing right now? We, we were talking about measuring that. How hard is it to measure mycorrhizal fungi? And, and sometimes they change their DNA when you're, when you're looking the other way. Is that what's going on? Um, I think the appreciation of soil microbes, bacteria, fungi, including our muscular mycorrhizal, is increasing, and we get 
all kinds of great questions from producers, laymen, gardeners, etc. And just so you know, we're working on all of them. We're just, but we, we, it's going to take a little time as we work through some of the tools, some of the obstacles, because uh, we can't even agree on what a species is for bacteria. Because you know why? Because they're down there swapping genes around, right and left. They're not waiting for a hotel room or anything else. <laughs> they're, they're just picking it up where it lays, and um, it really complicates the study of these organisms and the ecology of these organisms. But the goal, my goal, is to contribute to being able to measure this quantity of soil biological health and uh, this opportunity to work with this group and study the effect of grazing uh, on soil carbon and soil biology is a great opportunity to advance the tools we have to study uh, soil microbiology and its relationship to soil health. All right, um, uh, uh, Jason, could you give David the mic? So David, um, you also work uh, on the underground, uh, as it were, yes. and, and you're finding out that at a certain point the plant starts feeding the microbiome because it trusts that the microbiome is going to feed it. Yes, yes. So talk about that because that is such a, a new way of even thinking about what's going on down there. It's mind-blowing. As you start to build up the microbial community in the soils, you start to see a, a synergy develop between the plant and the soil microbes. Mm -hmm. um, in the biological world, you have to have a certain amount of bacteria, a quorum is what we call it, to have certain effects start to uh, happen. You get uh, gene transcriptions, you get uh, all types of different changes where they start to work in tandem with other organisms in the soil. So this is it's what I'm observing in, uh, I'm mostly in the cropland <laughs> approach, and you're seeing the uh, ability to grow more crops on less land with less water and no amendments, which is very important for... Let, let, let's, let me rephrase, let me say that again. Okay. You're finding out that you can grow more crops on less land with less water and less fertilizers, herbicides, and things like that. Yes. Thanks. And, and and so your early days on your studies, correct? Yes. And you've worked with chili, you've worked with cotton. Cotton. So, so a lot of these folks are right on what we were calling the bleeding edge of this, of this whole world. And, and this gentleman here is right there, and so we want to embrace his work. We and embrace people like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Take these hard topics out. <laughs> okay, so let's slide it down to Jason. Let, let's talk about... You can go um, in stereo, Jason. No, no, just, just take one. Let's talk about grazing and, and the, high, the idea, explain to me what conventional grazing is and then maybe we'll pass it over to Richard to talk about high stock density rotational grazing. We'll let you guys do tandem, tandem on this. Well certainly, um, if we uh, go back um, to the 1800s, uh, we have several uh, ruminants that are migrating um, across natural based grasslands. Um, ruminants are like? Um, Buff, bison, Buff, mm -hmm. yak, sheep, goats, whatnot. Got it. Caribou, mm -hmm. elk, elk. I'm sorry. Yeah, there you go. That's Thanks. Good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and so the so essentially, um, typically, what what is <laughs> what is adapted over time is the fact that that with fencing with and with human uh, management, uh, we began to confine those natural processes, mm -hmm. such that typically. Uh, animals are left in one area and, and essentially left to graze at their own, on their own behalf. And so what essentially happens is it's very important to understand that uh, to take what, what Christine had said about the plant being that important piece to draw the CO2 down, well equally important is that plant has to be defoliated and it has to be grazed down and, and that triggers the process. Uh, for the roots to produce the exudates and the other things to happen under the ground. So the animal has to be involved with that. And so what happens in a continuous system is that animals choose to only graze in certain areas. And when they do that, they may go and nibble on a plant. And you know what? They may not like this plant. But, and then they're going to go nibble on that same plant they just nibbled on a week earlier. That they like. And what happens is we get a, uh, something, uh, what we call overgrazing. Therefore, we lose the entire biology and we lose the entire beauty 
of why ruminants should be on grasslands. Mm -hmm. So Richard, talk about what uh, high stock density rotational grazing, how it approaches this, we, we're calling it a problem, and, and how it makes it a, a real solution. What Jason's been talking about is continuous grazing in the landscape, which is not uniform over the landscape. It concentrates on the preferred plants. And when you break that area up you know, with fencing or herding, so that the animals only graze a portion of it at a time, you can, a, a good management will allow for <coughs> correct degree of use and then movement off to allow those plants to recover where they have been grazed. So when you put a lot in there and, and, and it's, uh, they're compact and it's a short amount of time, they're gonna sort of do an even graze, then you get them off to the new section. That's right, so in that way, you can move the animals through the whole landscape and not overuse any portion of it. So then the plants stay healthy and the microbes stay healthy and all the processes that are uh, that drive the system are operating as well as they can. And that's the aim of good management is to get to that particular point. And so what Jason was talking about was all those herding animals would basically hit a spot really hard, they're really densely compacted, the wolves show up, push them off, and then there's rest period where that land's not touched for a while. So, so these guys are talking about basically managing that rest period and, and that's where the magic happens. Um, now, now, Becca, you guys are finding that if you do one more step with this process, you're, you're getting even more carbon sucking down into the ground. Talk about, talk about that work. Um, that's right. So I did some work in California. Um, and actually, the way this work came about is that um, some ranchers came up to us and they said, we have this land. We want to help solve climate change. What can we do? Um, and so that really transformed the way that we ask questions as scientists from a very impact based looking at what are the impacts of climate change to a very solutions based. So what's, what's out there, what can we do, what capacity do we have as land managers, as scientists to work together on this problem. So we started out by just looking in that region in Marin County um, at the amount of soil, uh, carbon that was in soils on a number of different ranches. And what we saw was that any uh, of those ranches that had been uh, received any organic matter amendments, meaning manure or compost, things like that, they had a lot more soil carbon. That makes sense because those organic materials contain carbon, but we wanted to know the ecosystem benefits of that. Are, is that not only are we adding carbon from that material, but are we also capturing, as Christine so nicely um, uh, uh, demonstrated, are we capturing more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through the plants and, and shunting that below ground uh, into stable pools? Um, so we did um, some well-replicated studies across California looking at the addition of compost. So we added a very thin layer of compost to these ranch lands. Half inch. Half, inch comp half an inch on the, sur on the soil surface. We had grazing in that system as well. Um, and what we saw uh, was that we increased soil carbon pools significantly. And this is typically really hard to tell of a short-term study. And this was not just the additional carbon from the compost, but actually the plants doing their job and bringing carbon below ground into the soil. You guys saw forage production almost go 50% more? Produ forage production on average was 50% higher uh, the first year, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, and now we're in the fifth year after just that one, one addition. Yeah. yeah. So we're seeing a really a shift in the way that the ecosystem cycles that carbon and other nutrients in that compost The rancher's well. name is John Wick and He's the reason I'm, I found out about this whole subject because I interviewed him very early on in, when I made Carbon Nation. And what, he, what happened for John was, you know, he wanted to buy a ranch with his wife. They had the means. They bought one in Marin County. They were told that cows were bad and the ranch had been used as, as, as you know, a place for people to bring their cows and lease it out. He took all the cows off his land and his land died immediately. And he wondered why. And that's that's this whole thing came out of that that got you a nice gig. Right, he, he, uh, so John brought in a, a really uh, excellent, innovative uh, rangeland expert named Jeff Creek, and he came onto the land and the first thing he said, well, where are your cows? You need some cows here. So right, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Now we're talking about cows eating grass, not eating corn, not going down that road. So, so Russ, let's get a mic down to Russ. Um, now we're gonna talk about the product, right? The, the, the steak that people who eat meat and my apologies to the folks who don't. Um, um, Grass-finished beef. Talk about your evolution for your own health to that subject. Well, well, uh, <clears throat> it's more of an education as a consumer, but certainly I'd, I'd uh, learned independently over the last several years about the differential biochemistry of grass-fed animals versus grain-fed animals. I'm nodding heads, so I think that knowledge is fairly broadly known out there now. 
And uh, then in terms of the, <coughs> the journey here, and I uh, heard this, uh, heard a TED talk by one of the characters in this play, Alan Savory, earlier this year, talking about how grass feeding cattle actually was good for the soil, like we just talked. And I said, hold on, there's two really important things here that just connected in my brain. Um, and then the third piece. Human health and, and, and Human health and health. land health. So you mean this thing that was, is really good for my own health is also good for the land health? Um, and, and then the third dot that really had to connect in there was having uh, led an innovation group for a major energy company. Uh, I, I realized, well, it's also good for solving this CO2 problem that we're working really hard on. And uh, do we get overall environmental health, land health, human health, economic health maybe, and a lot of things happening simultaneously. And um, through serendipity, honestly, uh, only a few weeks after I had uh, seen that TED talk, I met Peter and it's plugged me into this amazing community. And I, you know, I think it's still very early on, but uh, becoming a believer in the possibilities um, that, that are here based on early anecdotal evidence and, and some, some good foundational science. So, so Urs, let's, we're now into the economics of this. Yep, you gotta go. All right, good to see you. Yep, let's see, you guys are still good. Okay, um, attrition, uh, see y'all later. Um, so why don't, why don't you guys slide down one and I'll take your chair. This is, uh, this is to make it a good shot, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when, you see, when you see any award shows, they hire extras to sit in the empty seats to make sure it's full. It's just true. Um, so, so talk about the economics. It's one thing to say to a rancher, hey, this is better for Earth. But how is it for them? So um, all of us here on the panel actually are, come from a biophysical background. And a couple of us speak kind of funny. I think you might have noticed that. Richard and I actually both hail from Zimbabwe originally, um, uh, which is where Alan Savory did his early work as well. Um, so uh, I started as a grassland ecologist, but then eventually, you know, got to the point where I, I started asking the question, well, you know, we as scientists, we know what these uh, landowners should be doing with their land in order to improve or maintain the ecological health of their land, but why are they not doing it? You know, why should people care? What is, it, what is that motivating the decision maker? And when we talk about management of land or management of ecosystems, it's actually the management of people more than anything that we're, we're, we're talking about. And so I started asking the question, well, um, is it just an eco is it a profitability question? And one thing that's uh, quite apparent is a lot of landowners don't manage their land for, to become wealthy. In fact, many of them are asset rich and cash poor. And so they do it for a lifestyle purpose more than just an economic purpose. And so that then led me to the next stage is I you know, started asking the question, well, if it's not just economics, then what is the driver? And how can we use the motivators for people for owning land to help them improve their management and do that in a voluntary, positive manner rather than some sort of coercive, legislative manner where we try and beat people over the head and tell them, if you don't, you know, you'll be in trouble. And so what I really focus on is the incentivization of landowners to improve their individual decision making with respect to the ecological health of the land. But I'm also very interested in, in uh, trying to understand how people can be encouraged to make decisions together. Because if you're talking about landscape level improvements, you cannot just focus on the individual property because often the property boundaries are ecologically completely irrelevant. And so you want to be working at the watershed scale or landscape scale. So one of the real questions is, well, how can you get people who may or may not be friends across the border, how can you get them to work together? So most recently, we've been doing quite a lot of work with prescribed burn associations using fire as a restoration tool in areas that have been become very heavily intensified with woodlands, and uh, which w wasn't what they used to be. They used to be open grasslands or savannas. And fire, and I believe part of the reason is, is because probably I'm willing to bet that most of us sitting in this room have a little bit of a pyromaniac in us, you know, throwing a match out there and seeing things burn. Um, it's, it's a very kinetic, it's a very visible kind of thing, and I think that's one of the reasons why the reintroduction of fire in Texas through these prescribed burn associations has, and I excuse the pun, literally taken off like wildfire. And these prescribed burn associations have developed across the state up through the plains uh, in a number of uh, states now. So that's what I'm really interested in un understanding. We, when we know, what, you know how we can improve land management, what kind of practices can be implemented, uh, and now with respect to grazing systems, is 
How can we get people to adopt them? Because for years we've been saying, well, you should be doing this, but people don't. So why don't they? And how can we get them to do it? So uh, yesterday in our conversation, we brought up FIRE. And it, it could be its own hour-long conversation. But in a nutshell, when you one of the basically using FIRE when the land is in real bad shape may be a solution. But when the land's already in really good shape, it's not a good solution because you're going to really affect all that biome that you've built up. That's kind of what we said yesterday. I know we could go deeper into that. So, so Richard, um, this is the last question I'm going to ask you all, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Let's talk about ranchers you know and experiences that they've had with going towards the high stock density rotational grazing, making the small paddocks, moving them around. Uh, talk about. Just give us one rancher. Let's get a personal story that, that you can share. When I first came to the country, I identified the leading conservation ranchers, and those are most of the people <coughs> I work with. And one in particular, the first, um, he'd been operating using intensive grazing for nearly 30 years, his family. And they had a picture of a place in really good condition. Um, and they were brought up in a multiple generations of having a very strong conservation ethic. But some of the other folk who were motivated were also into wildlife and knew that they had to manage habitat. And they could use the livestock to A, earn from it, but also manipulate the habitat so it was good for wildlife. And in Texas, that's a very big part of our incomes. And most of the folk that I deal with um, who are using intensive systems uh, manage for cattle and the wildlife. And they use the one to optimize the habitat for the other. Because what's good for a cow is good for deer. When everything's bustling, you got yourself a nice system there. Yes. you. If you use the cows in a certain way, uh, so using the microbes, then you're speeding up the nutrient uh, cycling component. There's more green around, and the wildlife respond to that a lot. And you can manipulate that um, for most purposes using your livestock intelligently. So I've met ranchers who have an extra income by leasing their land for hunting during hunting season. And it was just for cows before. It's, it's, it's unending benefits. I've been hunting and hunting for a downside, and I haven't found it yet. Um, I'm, I'm looking, my eyes are wide open. So let's open it up to questions. Um, and when you ask your question, I think we've got one of these mics, we'll, we'll, we'll shift around. Wait till you get the mic, if you can, and, uh, and let's give it a shot. Yep, right up here. Before you ask your question, I just want to make a, an apology to everybody up here. When there's 10 people in one hour, no one gets to talk enough and you end up sitting there for a long time. I, my apologies for that. Okay, yes, please. Could have had a second round of falafel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's gone. Everyone ate it. In my Futures magazine, they, there was a short article about um, how plants are starting to take some of the carbon dioxide out of the air that we're so concerned about, and that this could be a, an actual s part of the solution However, they said if we continue with our um, present day consumptions of fuel, then um, we'd never be able to actually keep up. Do, we know, do you know anything about that and can you so, elaborate on that? So basically what you're saying is can we suck down more carbon than we're emitting, basically. Um, Steve, why don't you jump on that? Everybody heard the question? What, basically what is the role of biology in solving the problems of climate change rather than techno fixes. Uh, there's been a series of uh, scientific investigations and business uh, uh, community investigations, and they all point toward the lowest cost, most practical, and quickest acting uh, solving the problem or contributing to solving the problem, solutions being those that are biologically and ecosystem based, working with nature rather than trying to come up with some techno fix. Uh, I think some of the oil companies, and I don't want to put anybody on the panel uh, on the spot, but some of the oil companies that were looking at pumping CO2 into the ground mechanically, are mechanically with huge pumps and pipelines and a range of other uh, feats of, of magic uh, have figured out that plants can do it a lot better and a lot faster and it doesn't cost $38 trillion, is my understanding. Uh, so I, and, 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 and some of the mass balance studies that have been done so looking at the amount of carbon up there and the amount of capacity for taking in new carbon in the soil and looking at the candidates, the workforce, the labor force, uh, a lot of unemployed plants out there, uh, we can put those guys to work with the bacteria and the microbes. And, and it looks like with, with uh, the healthy 
balancing of the system that you're talking about here, that there is in fact a real possibility that we can address uh, major, major percentages, maybe all of the, the excessive atmospheric emissions just by what we're talking about here today. And the real nature, get the mic down to Russ and while the mic's going over there, the real nature of, of this group coming together is there's scant data to prove that. And we want to start building that science to say, yeah, it does work. Here's how it works. Here's what's bringing in. So it's bringing in this much carbon. It's bringing in the mycorrhizal fungi and all the bacteria are happening. The wildlife's happening. Our entomologist had to get a plane before the thing started. So our Just bug guy. Don't forget the grasshoppers. Yeah. yeah, the insects. So Russ, do you want to add to what? Yeah, I, just, I, mean, I really wanted to anchor it in that is uh, the state of the science is fairly immature. Um, and it's exactly why we've been together this week is to try to outline a plan for research where we can go do that. Anecdotally, we can point to, so, so um, Steve here has done some really extensive trials in Washington State on no-till agriculture land. And I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of rough numbers here that basically over a 17-year period sequestered on average 23 tons of carbon per hectare. So if th some of you want to go around, take that and, and scale it up, it turns into something that could be really big. Um, Richard's farmers, uh, ranchers there in North Texas and Christine's uh, done some work in Australia to suggest, again, anecdotally, not systematic yet, uh, really, or it's very localized, let's put it that way, uh, that within 10 years they're seeing numbers in the range of 50 tons per hectare uh, of new carbon, carbon, that of wasn't new carbon before, uptake so. differential to uh, people continuing normal practices. Meaning carbon from the air. And, and, and one of the real challenges here is that, you know, they're nice anecdotes, but you know, can they really scale? And it's not only the, the, the geography and geology and biology of the scale, it's the human part of the scale, like Urs was talking about, is how do you, how, how do you replicate practices across enough landscape? Because there is, if you take those kind of numbers I just shared with you and you scale them up across global landscapes, indeed, you come up with numbers that, that really do put a, a dent in the overall carbon budget of the planet. But we don't have this, the, the science to really demonstrate that we can do that broadly yet. We have a couple of intriguing points that say it's anecdotally possible, and a lot of research yet to be done. Okay, uh, uh, next one. Um, let's see, uh, how about this gentleman here? He was here first, I think. Yeah, I, uh, yeah I, I was just wondering how big a problem is the receding wetlands in the uh, planet's ability to absorb carbon? Yeah, Steve just did that, so you need to get going. Okay, let's uh, thank, uh, thank Richard T. Thanks, Give Richard. <laughs> Do this. Ni Whoa, nice seeing you, Richard. <laughs> yeah, it's um, the, quest the question about wetland decline and, the, and what role do wetlands play in the planetary carbon budget. Uh, I've just been in a three-day brain draining session in New Orleans talking about the future of the Delta and the Gulf Coast wetlands. And uh, the Gulf Coast wetlands uh, um, in the sediments that are actively vegetated there's about 24 million tons of carbon. Uh, that's that's the estimate, and the and the estimate is per higher. Acre? Uh, tons total, of carbon. Total of, of pure C, not not. But C. in what size space? Uh, it, it it's about 24 million acres in rough in rough acreage. Okay. Uh, from uh, uh, Brownsville, Texas, all the way to Mobile, Alabama, basically. And that's not looking at the lower deposits that are ancient deposits. That's just the active living layer. The projections right now are uh, 8 to 22 square miles of coastal loss per year, uh, accelerating to 15 uh, to as many as 50 square miles of coastal loss square miles of coastal loss per year. Uh, that would translate to about 17. Uh, 14 to 17 percent of the of the total emissions from this country coming from those wetlands and their decline. One fire that occurred in at the Pocosin Lake National Wildlife Refuge in, in coastal North Carolina, where coastal wetlands have been ditched and tiled and used for agriculture, released something like 22 million tons of CO2. The entire East Coast. And even Washington, D.C. had a brown haze for the week that that fire was in play. And it never made headlines. Never. So, so uh, in, in answer, the wetlands are huge. Huge, huge. And restoring them yeah. is massive, massive uh, potential. Yeah. And, and uh, our second carbonation conversation 
is uh, all about that. If you want to look online on ASU's website, it's all about just that. They call it blue carbon. That's right. Yeah, so it's, it's a whole new field as well. And it's looking amazing. So uh, open it up again. Um, yep. Wait for the mic. Hi. Uh, last week I read about an article about McDonald's going uh, sustainable beef by 2016. Can you talk about what that's going to do, if it's going to do anything, if, there, if, if that's something that's real, and what is the impact of that massive uh, company is going to have in the, this process that you're working on? Just like thinking economics. If you're not cool with it, I could send it down the, down the line. Yeah, it's probably better. Jason, you want it? Sure. Okay, let's give it to Jason. Um, well, I think, uh, first of all, sustainable is such a broad term. Um, I prefer to look at triple bottom line agriculture such that it's environmentally uh, regenerative, it's profitable, and it is socially uh, beneficial. And so it, I think the first thing I would say is I would like to wait and see what their overall definition of sustainable is. Secondly, it's important, I know, to understand that, you know, McDonald's employs 900,000 people in our country daily. And so if, if we just do away with McDonald's, um, we're still going to have issues, if that makes sense. And so um, I, I do applaud them that they are becoming more aware. I know that Peter has, has actually spoke with them. I've got colleagues there that they are beginning to address some of the, the challenges that such a, a, a global um, type food system is, has provided. Can I just continue with it? Yeah. Sure. I knew you had something. Well, well what I was going to say, again, um, you know, often when people start adopting new practices is when they're incentivized to do so. So if a McDonald's or Walmart says, well, we're only going to uh, um, stock environmentally friendly beef, then there's a lot of landowners who will start managing the land in a way that uh, subscribes to that particularly if there's a premium for it. So I think it's exactly this sort of a, um, uh, occasion which can result in these catalytic events where a lot of land managers start doing things in a different manner. So I think it's positive. I mean, again, it's a question of how far are they willing to push that, how do they define it, there's <laughs> kind of issues. Mm -hmm. But any, any big corporations like that, when they make a kind of policy shift, that can have a tremendous impact. Both inside and outside the company. And so I just want to add to that, because I think this is an opportunity for all of you. It's certainly where I came into this thing is, is th that's, that's not some abstract thing. It's basically the growth of organic uh, m food, uh, farmers markets, all these things, they're happening because consumers like you choose to spend your dollars differently. And you have so much control. Just last week, some of you would have known that General Mills has decided to go a GMO-free Cheerios product. You would have caught that announcement. Uh, it, regardless of how you feel, that's a it's completely market-based signal. So to the extent that you do choose to to eat uh, meats and agricultural products, if you have a choice where you can purchase products that have been sourced from things that are healthy to the soil, the market will get that signal. In fact, I think it's the strongest signal, frankly, at the end of the day, better than government policy, better than anything. The moment you start demanding things, that's how to make this really happen. Okay, cool, next question, yes ma'am. Um, when you all were talking about uh, greater plant productivity, and I'm assuming it was not just in grasslands, but also in grains. Uh, I was thinking that would be not be monoculture, correct? It would be a mix of different grasses or different plants See. and grains growing together. Hey, Christine, and why don't you take that? Yeah, and yep. has this mix at least been scoped out a little bit so that you know what it is? Um, place that is this on? I'm, pl I'm pleased that you raised that issue because um, it's always been a concern of mine that we've grown food in a monoculture way, that we, we have thousands and thousands of hectares of one thing, and now they're finding that there is much greater benefit to the soil to having a mixture, and it can still be not only just as productive but more productive. And it's very important that that mixture contains different kinds of plants, like we have the grass kinds of plants like corn and... Uh, and wheat and those, they're all in that same family, they're all in the grass family, but then you have your other, other plants like your soybeans and um, different kinds of legumes, or legumes I think you call them, <laughs> that are, are different. So that the more different kinds of plants and the bigger the mixture that you have, some farmers now are putting at least 20 different kinds of plants into those fields. When they plant their crop, at least 20 different kinds and they're finding huge benefits. 
and also a big benefit from integrating livestock into their cropping systems. So not having grazing as one way of managing land and cropping as another way of managing land, but fully integrating uh, cropping and grazing and it builds on each other. I can see Peter doing the stacking there from mm -hmm. my peripheral vision. Nice uh, done. It's nice the vertical done. stacking <laughs> uh, that you're, you're not taking away from anything you're building and it's using all these natural processes um, that you get these synergistic effects that once you start to get all of the pieces of the jigsaw in there, the whole picture works so much better. And yes, diversity. Diversity above ground equates to diversity below ground and the diversity below ground is what links everything and gets the whole underground ecosystem. We have to remember that it's the underground ecosystem that's driving the above ground ecosystem or supporting the above ground ecosystem and all of that is driven by energy which comes from the CO2 in the air that's converted through photosynthesis into a, um, a carbon compound that provides energy to drive that whole underground engine. So we just have to see how these linkages work and diversity is a very important part of it. And that's going to uh, equate to improved nutrient density in our food as well. We, we are at the end of that food chain, remember. We're actually at the end of a food chain that starts with CO2 in the atmosphere. We're the ultimate consumers of, of that. And we, we need carbon for our bodies and we need the nutrient for our bodies and, and we have to figure out how to manage our plants and our animals to get that excess CO2 from the atmosphere through the whole soil ecosystem and into good quality food for people. Christine has a paper, I, I think it's somewhat like solar energy is not just for rooftops. Yeah, solar is uh, not just for your rooftops, it builds soil too. Right, so pass it on to Wendy, um, same mic, and, and <coughs> give us a picture below ground of a monocrop grassland and a cocktail mix multi-crop grassland, what's happening downstairs? Okay, so that's, that's kind of a complex question because there's so many things going on. Um, a monoculture doesn't, doesn't allow any kind of below ground diversity. So you need the, up, the above ground diversity to promote the below ground diversity. And a lot of people don't understand what a niche is um, because it's something different no matter what organism you're talking about. But it's everything you need to flourish. So uh, it means food, shelter, and a mate, or some means of reproduction. It's a niche is everything you need to grow and create more of your own kind. And when you only have a monoculture, you limit the number of niches. And that limits the number of microbes that can survive in that environment. And so with a diverse above ground uh, flora, you get below ground fauna, and those guys can access more forms of nutrients, because the nutrients the plants need are bound. They're bound to minerals in the soil, they're bound to organic matter, and they have to become available to the plant so that the plant can grow. So you get the cycle of feedback between the organisms and the plants. And the greater the number of niches for your microbes, then the more forms of nutrients you can bring up, the more water you can bring up, and they feed back on each other and you get much higher productivity. And Mike, you wanna add to that? Hmm. Um, I'm thinking directly about uh, agronomy. Uh, a lot of our work at the research lab, we're trying to get systems that are more diverse uh, out there to farmers that are cropping. With uh, This group's mostly interested in grazing, and, and the take-home point here is to increase primary productivity and increase diversity. We need cattle on the land and we need them, uh, gra uh, well, we hope they're grazed in appropriate methods to, to encourage those things. But also in agricultural production, crop production systems, what we're trying to do is get farmers to, to grow a diversity of crops, so in, in temporal sequence, not just corn, not just corn soybean or wh whatever your flavor is. But, but the real thing we wanna change is fallow. fallow is really not good. Fallow means nothing's growing, it's bare dirt. Fallow is, is, a, is a real issue. Um, if you wanna grow the soil health, the soil biological health, you have to have something growing there. So we're introducing farmers that don't uh, use cover crops to cover crops. That's a crop you grow when you're not growing your cash crops. Folks are doing research on interseeding uh, another plant at the same time pulse crops, uh, double cropping. There's all kinds of techniques that have actually been around for years that are coming back around, maybe for different reasons, 
and hopefully we're providing the data sets to support them that having something growing, having a diversity of things growing is the best thing you can do for your land, whether you're a farmer, a rancher, or a gardener. You create a diversity of niches. And a couple of things you didn't even think about. You know, if, if you have a uh, fallow land, do you know how much more wind erosion you have? Do you know how much more water erosion you have? Do you know how much higher the soil, soil temperature, temperature is, is on, on the, the top, top centimeter, centimeter or how, how much, much UV exposure, exposure or desiccation, desiccation occurs? All those stresses in the absence of vegetation kill the microbes. So, so the answer that's, is... That's, that's the answer. Grow some stuff. I know, Becca, you, you wanted to add something. Did you want to add something to this? I, I thought I saw you. Well, I was uh, just going to make a point early on. The, the question originally was about uh, diverse uh, grasses, grasslands. And just to make the point that rangelands, uh, that's a very broad term, but we're talking about a lot of different types of ecosystems. Some of them are grass-dominated. Some of them have a, a mix of shrubs and are more like an oak savanna. So the, uh, the context for the research that needs to be done and the socioeconomic questions that needs to be done also needs to take into account differences across these the, the large global scales that we're talking about. But the potential is definitely there across all of those ecosystems. And the, the principles, principles that we're talking about, I mean, just the fundamental principles of diverse, diverse systems being more resilient and, and likely to be storing more carbon works across all of those diverse systems. Yep. Okay, cool. Let's go to a question here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, real, very quick question. More and more cities are, in fact, you brought up the question of urban agriculture. More and more cities are writing urban agriculture into the general plans. Tucson did recently. How is this going to affect carbon sequ sequestration one way or another, positively or negatively? You want to go for that? Um, we had the pleasure and honor of being involved in some of the first uh, urban agricultural programs in the U.S., in Vermont, the Chicago region, and elsewhere. And what, uh, what's so exciting to me is uh, some of the master planning work that's being done for example, the green infrastructure plan for Chicago metro region that we just worked on with the Conservation Fund and one we're doing for Kansas City now is putting a reservation on, on high quality agricultural land to make sure that's available for local food production in the future and not going to be you know, uh, compromised out of, the, out of existence by development or whatever. So, so critically... That's the ring. What about infill? What about same, agriculture same, inside? Same thing. Uh, you know, there's wonderful uh, uh, stories now about reinvestment in downtown Milwaukee and Detroit and all, you know, Hartford, Connecticut and all sorts of places. Uh, uh, Liberia, Costa Rica, San Jose, Costa Rica, um, uh, Santiago, Chile, uh, where people are investing in agriculture in the downtowns instead of, you know, relying on what's coming in from out of country or out of region. So very exciting. I think, I think that, that is, is, the, is, is the finger on the pulse of the market shift that's occurring now, that uh, people are so excited and so concerned about the quality of their food and where their food's coming from, and that, that is a growing marketplace and a growing demand for not only buying food that they know is healthy, but knowing the story, uh, the educational piece of you know, where is it coming from and how is it contributing to a better planet rather than uh, not. So very, very important question. And let's let's get the mic down to Urs real quick. Um, as, it, as, it's going, as it's going this way, um, and we'll get it back to you, Jason. Um, to the gentleman's question, are we going to see cattle grazing to stimulate soil inside the cities? Could we? Uh, it's, I think it's possible. Actually, there's um, an interesting case study in South Africa with one of our former students who um, is, uh, is, is a, a planner in South Africa. And one of the things that he started doing was saying, you know, the idea of uh, developing uh, residential areas around golf courses, that's pretty much dead because of the water requirements and there's too many golf courses, all those kind of things. Why don't we do that in the proximity of farms? And so he's actually done it in the context of a dairy farm. So the development is occurring within a dairy farm, but the dairy farm is going to continue. So I think having cattle in some of these newer developments uh, is certainly feasible. Uh, bringing them into existing areas, that may be a little trickier because there's all kind of veterinary issues and you know, safety issues and things like that. But one thing I'd, uh, I'd like to just comment on in relation to the question about urban uh, farming and, and crop production is that, you know, many of our cities developed on some of the most productive soils. 
mm. because people settled there for agricultural purposes and then the areas just expanded. So the potential for production in some of those areas if those soils can be utilized is very high. And so from a carbon sequestration perspective, the, the, that should have a very positive effect. And the other thing which I also just want to comment quickly is that, you know, we often assume that urban areas provide no ecosystem services. And that's a primary assumption that's been made by many studies to try and evaluate all of the world's ecosystems. Well, it's simply not true. We actually did an evaluation of land use change and the impact on the delivery of ecosystem services in Barakani, which is where San Antonio is uh, situated. And what we found is that the drop where you had ur urbanization wasn't that great uh, in some cases. And we said, oh, this is surprising. Why wouldn't it be greater than it was? Well, you have a lot of lawns, you have a lot of trees, you have a lot of uh, vegetation in those urban areas that are, in fact, sequestering carbon. Maybe not as efficiently as in some of the more natural areas. And so the question is, can we get the cover, uh, the green cover that is in urban areas to be much more efficient from a photosynthetic perspective, in other words, capturing that carbon and putting it in the soil. So I think the move is very positive. It's just a question of how is it applied. And as it's going to Jason, I was just, I think, I don't know if it was our first dinner, the idea of a, of a cocktail mix for lawns. Like, can, everyone likes a lawn. Everyone likes to take their shoes off and walk through a lawn. That shouldn't be a crime. And um, certainly in, in Phoenix, lawns take water, but they also cool down the urban heat island effect. And, What's the winner in that combo? I, I, I'm sure that someone has an answer to that in this room. But if, if there's like a cocktail mix that really enables a great, a great below ground life, that could be very, very, I mean, that's a lot of land. I've talked to John Wick about that. It's a lot of land. 45 million acres across the country in lawns. 45 million acres 45 million of lawns. Million so we're going to go to you after Jason. Okay. So first <laughs> I would say that um, I think every citizen deserves access to high quality food. And I think that has to be established. I think secondly, I, I was taken aback about three years ago at a sustainability meeting and it just so happened at the table was um, the person that oversaw uh, the purchasing program for the school lunches in Detroit. And we were talking and she said, I wanna get grass finished beef into Detroit. And of course I, I was taken aback a little bit. Um, and, and there's currently schools in Detroit now that are actually growing all their own greens in, in hoop structures outside the schools that are being served. Um, as it pertains to livestock in an urban environment, I think the one, one barrier obviously is gonna be expertise. But what I would say is, would it be smarter potentially to, just as we had challenges in urban environments, we also have tremendous rural poverty as well. Um, these areas uh, have um, 30, 30 plus uh, percent obesity, there's still food deserts there. Uh, 80, in Northern Michigan, 80% of the students are on school lunch programs. So I do a lot of food systems work, and so what I would offer then is that, would it be a benefit to tie these areas in rural landscapes that are adjacent to urban areas and create local systems that provide a anamnestic or a symbiotic type of uh, triple bottom line to both areas for an overall improvement in terms of our society. Back up. Um, another point that I wanted to make about lawns is that they're a huge source of nitrous oxide, which is a really potent greenhouse gas, almost 300 times more powerful than CO2. Um, and it's been shown across many cities that, that that's a, a huge source of global warming potential of the entire city. Um, so diversifying them with different grasses might be an option, but uh, transforming them into food systems in urban environments is, I think holds incredible potential even if it doesn't store carbon in the soil, you're likely reducing the, uh, avoiding those emissions of nitrous oxide. And uh, another point is that uh, a lot of cities are now um, doing curbside composting. I'm not sure if that's happening here in Arizona, but um, San Francisco, Oakland, Berkeley, New York just started it. Um, there's bills up in Connecticut, Vermont, and LA. I think Massachusetts. LA. So I think there's a real movement growing here, and the question is, what do we do with those organic waste? It's wonderful that they're not going to the landfill because then they're not producing methane, which is another greenhouse gas. Um, and so putting them back on rangelands, as we showed in our study, is one option, but also putting them back locally in the urban environments holds incredible potential. So even if the answer may not be in the soil in that case, it mm -hmm. might be in uh, avoiding those other greenhouse gases. Waste is good. Up, oh, Wendy's. A you asked a very good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Since our entomologist had to leave and catch a plane, I thought I'd uh, 
speak for, for him here uh, for a minute. Um, when I was in Indiana, uh, it was a big thing to bring in native plants to replace lawns, because lawns are monocultures, right? And so they suffer the same problem as croplands do. And one of the things that I noticed, because it was just sort of becoming a fad when I first moved there, is the buzzing sound. I had moved there from Hawaii, which they, we don't have a lot of insects there, and it was really quiet at night, and I hear all this buzzing and chirping. You know, lawns are havens for beneficial insects and pollinators. Um, if you replace them with native plants and, and diversity, again, to get insect diversity, you need the plant diversity. And so that all these systems just sort of come together and interlink. You know, you just reminded me, I, I lived in Los Angeles a long time, and I have these friends of mine, Alex and Robin, and they had this house in West Hollywood that they grew a whole bunch of different plants. And what I missed most living in LA were the bug sounds of the summer from Kentucky, and their lawn had the bug sounds. That's a, I mean, it's, it was that simple. They just planted a bunch of stuff and the bug showed up. Just a quick comment is, um, I think if we're really concerned about this, uh, we need to be spe speaking to our city councils. Because, you know, I live in College Station in, in Texas, and uh, if I let the lawn get anything more than like about four inches high, I get a, a code violation notification on my door. I've got to cut it down. And obviously, if you're going to grow natives, you've got to let them grow higher because that's what they do. Is that, um, is that your homeowners association or is that the city? No, that's the city. That's the city. That's the city. That's the city. Okay, Russ? Yeah, we employ too many people there, apparently. Got it. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's going to put in a little segue here. I actually ran across here a couple of weeks ago something came out of the University of Texas here recently called Habiturf, which is a polyspecies lawn crop for dry climates. I don't know if it extends to Arizona, but I think there's people working on this. Habit turf? Habit turf. Um, and uh, so, I th but what I was going to say, especially since Arizona State's an educational institution, one of the things that's very intriguing about your question about urban environments, I, uh, I, I think what we're looking at here is something that's symptomatic of the bigger challenges in society that we, you know, in this group we call it re reductionist science or whatever. We break things into little pieces and solve those problems, and we forget how it all connects back together again. And I think nature does that intrinsically. So one of the things I find most intriguing about the reinvigoration of urban gardening, getting students out, growing their own greens and things like that, is, is a rediscovery. It's, it's like an educational tool, if nothing else, right? That we, we start to realize, oh, you know, the plant productivity depends on that stuff in the dirt. And if I do this to it, bad things happen. And, and I think those things will translate into healthcare, into economics and finance, into energy systems where I come from, because I think all of these things suffer from our inability to understand how things fit together. So I think part of the next phase here is sitting back and relearning from nature probably many of the things we've forgotten. I'm very, uh, may maybe I even see if I can invite Christine here, because she's done a lot of work working with the Aboriginal people in Australia uh, and, and kind of rediscovering um, how, how to use uh, nature to achieve these things. Oh, thanks for that, Russ. I was just going to comment on the schools. Um, because we have a program in Australia called Kitchen Gardens, and the uh, Kitchen Gardens, I'm not sure whether you have them here, but the, the general idea started with primary school children, and it was just basically to grow some lettuce and tomatoes and stuff, and then turn it into some food and go, oh, hey, we can grow our own food. But that uh, initial beginning has really um, just blossomed into now understanding, uh, as you were saying about the soils. Well, if we grow the lettuce in this kind of soil, but then if we have this kind, if we make some compost or do you, you know improve soil health and we get some earthworms and hey the lettuce tastes better you know at actually doing taste tests on things grown with in different ways and then that uh, transforms into the the broader question that you were talking about well how is all of our food grown and then um, yeah so that's it's really it's so important to for the education to begin with those kids it's now gone into secondary schools uh, and we have and people have not Traditionally, for probably the last couple of decades, people haven't seen agriculture as a career or as a, as a worthwhile career. Um, people that come from farming backgrounds have been interested, some of them, going back into agriculture. But, you know, if you've got brains, it's more or less, well, you go into law or you go into medicine or something. You know, we want the people with the brains to be going into ag and, and to be understanding about these, the soil biology and how to, to um, nurture these systems that support the whole planet and support our health as well. Uh, so just on the on the Aboriginal question, that's a, a very interesting one uh, in that um, land has been uh, given back to Indigenous communities but there hasn't been any way 
forward for those people in terms of managing that land because they've tried to manage it in the same way that European people have managed it and we've basically, um, our management systems have resulted in deterioration. So it provides a really uh, exciting avenue for reconnecting people with traditional methods of land uh, management that restore soil and restore ecosystem balance and more of an understanding of diversity and how all of the different things link together. So with what remains of Aboriginal culture in Australia, which isn't very much, um, we're trying to grasp those last remaining links and restore them and rejuvenate them, bring them back into, like, so we're bringing back understanding from traditional ownership, linking that with some of the understanding that we have from with current ownership and bringing, bringing it all together, I think, is just so exciting to, um, and it's all based on understanding the natural processes and how to get them to work better. It's a, so it's a, it's a great journey to be on, I have to tell you, it's so exciting. Yeah, you're going to see a lot of smiling faces. Yeah, let's uh, go with your question. Are folks in the back raising their hand? Because I'm not seeing it. Okay, so we got to get back there. Sorry. On the same line, I was just wondering, uh, that you work with Aboriginal people, uh, is there any particular um, difference you see in their perspective of the world uh, compared to the sci scientific people or, or science? So yeah, I, I did, but it's a very difficult question to answer because the problem is that we've gone through a whole lot of generations now of um, there's been there's been a loss of knowledge and loss of understanding. There is still very much a, a connection with the land and a very strong spiritual connection. I guess that's probably about the only thing that's remaining with a lot of these people. It's a very strong spiritual connection to land and a and a desire to um, to to nurture it and and to reconnect with it but a lot of the knowledge as to how it used to be managed has unfortunately been gone has been lost yeah this yeah. in the same line again um what i notice in science um i see that that part is actually missing the connection the spiritual actually connection with the land and the real connection and i see all the science is there but i often don't see ever a scientist talk about that actual, because if it's not there, how can we actually do anything at all? Right. We're going to shift it over here to answer your last statement. And then there's a gentleman in the back row, two-tone shirt. Let's give him, but Steve's going to answer your point now. We, we've been working with uh, Ojibwe and Chippewa, uh, Native First Nation in uh, Canada and in the United States. Uh, it's so remarkable to me. They, they've been on the verge of absolutely losing their traditional knowledge, as you're probably aware. Uh, and it was one individual, a dying, a uh, uh, the uncle of a dear friend of mine who had cancer that called his son back, who's Ojibwe, uh, and said, I must teach you about the traditional knowledge of wild rice, of production and harvesting, and the spiritual relationships and the cultural uh, ties. And, and he, he gave up a Wall Street job and came back to uh, Wisconsin. The son did. His son did, yeah. Roger Labine with the Lac Vieux d'Azur Ojibwe tribe. And, and uh, basically, at the request of his uncle, took that on as a personal mission to learn that and bring it back to his people. And the interaction with science is an interesting segue. Uh, not only was the traditional knowledge of harvesting and processing, there's quite a, quite a process to parch it and know when to harvest it and, uh, and know how much to take from the, the plant population before you deplete it and a lot of other things. Uh, um, not only was that at risk, uh, but, but the relationship of the community to that plant and to their whole, their whole culture, uh, menomen, uh, menomen, uh, is, is basically one of the Menominee, Wisconsin, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. In Wisconsin and Minnesota, Menomen, uh, uh, I don't pronounce it the way Roger does, is one of the fundamental words in, in, the, in the place names in our state, and it means wild rice. And everything about it was being lost, and it was this connection between a dying uncle and one individual that brought it back into the culture and now he's offering rice camps. So p anybody, uh, you know, 50 people show up and learn how to harvest. It's a remarkable story and a remarkable process. 
So the science entered into it. They wanted to know, um, we've forgotten where we used to harvest rice. And uh, they knew of a couple of the bigger beds. Uh, it's an aquatic plant that grows in lake shores. <coughs> Excuse me. And we, we actually went up in the air with a, a high, uh, a very high uh, precision airplane, a camera in an airplane. And we photographed 800 square miles. And we found uh, hundreds of populations of wild rice in an area that's not accessible. It's all, you canoe to get into this area. And uh, what was remarkable was when we took the air photographs back to the elders, and, and uh, then Roger, speaking in Nishtanabi, said, what do you know about this place? What do you know about this place? And it was remarkable. Uh, the, the, the oral history associated with some of the places was still there and on the verge of being completely lost you know, it was four or five elders that still remained that knew of it, uh, had harvested when they were kids. Uh, so just remarkable, you know, a little link with science, uh, helping map what was present, and then now working with them to do restoration plans and engaging the community in participatory restoration. So the kids are getting involved, and not just the Native Americans, but non-Native Americans as well now. It's becoming really, really exciting, in my opinion. Very, very thrilling. Sort of uh, in another uh, light too, one of the things I think most of us who are on this panel and people who are at this meeting are very interested in is uh, systems thinking and systems approaches to resource management. Um, one of the reasons the sort of reduction of science has become very effective is that it is reduced onto specific questions which can be answered in a very quick and rapid manner. Problem is, is you don't uh, consider what are the feedback effects because you're not looking from a systems perspective anymore. And so science has been good in providing solutions to specific problems, but it hasn't been particularly good in most instances in providing solutions to systems questions. And that's really what we're trying to do among our group and many of us you know, working in our own fields are trying to incorporate a systems thinking approach where you can't just address one issue, you've got to address multiple issues and then understand the linkages between them. All right, back in the back row. Hold on one sec, let's get the mic on. Hello. There you go. It's really encouraging to hear you all up here. Um, this is exactly the topic I'm proposing to research in my graduate program. So I was just searching <coughs> graduate programs, and I found it really kind of rare to find uh, people doing research in diversified farming systems, grazing on the same land as polycultures um, for nutritional purposes, um, crop wild relatives, um, keeping, uh, looking at the domestication process of plants. Um, and animals and how that affects and all this. So this is really encouraging to hear. Um, I know programs like Berkeley, um, even UC Davis and a couple others are doing this research that shows the effectiveness of uh, bio biologically diversified farming systems on preserving species diversity but also being highly productive. Um, and I had a little trouble finding, like there was an absence of that, of people doing this type of research and there seems to be underfunding for this type of research. Uh, do you have any suggestions on where to, where to <laughs> look to? <laughs> Before I let them have it, the, the recruiter sign just went off on my head here. Are you looking at ASU? I apply at ASU as well. Yeah. At, in, in which school? The geography program. In the geography program. So when you come and you get in, come to the School of Sustainability as well. We do things across borders. That yes, I have We don't see borders. Okay, so you're good there. All right, so you just brought up the thing of funding. And um, I, I'd say just about any, any everyone wants more money. I'm, I'm a filmmaker, funding's a big deal. Can we pass the hat when we're done? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but the idea of funding with this particular piece, we're so far in front, it seems like, that, yeah, there has been some, some bumps and stuff like that. So Urs, you've got the mic, so. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, Research funding across the board has become much more constrained from t traditional sources. Um, coming from sort of a background where I deal with land managers, I think increasingly people who are interested in production type issues, systems type questions, need to be really partnering with industry and with, uh, with um, corporations to uh, conduct some of that work. And, and that's a lot of what's going on. Um, so getting, you know, uh, research funds, we struggled for three years to get research funds from the Natural Resources Conservation Service to look at the efficacy of in, uh, intensive grazing management. 
no particular interest in that because unfortunately a lot of the science funding is driven by publish it immediately. And if you cannot publish it immediately, which you cannot do with a systems type research approach, it becomes a problem. So there's um, often not that much incentive. It's not to say the funding is not there, but it's much more challenging. Challenging or not, that's our ambition. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and so just, I'm not discouraging. we're just starting. And, and if and you're asking about your job track future, rather than funding for research, which may be on your mind. Um, most of the big companies now thinking about this word sustainability, the, going back to the or original question that was asked, are starting to inject uh, systems thinkers and alternative sort of thinking into their, into their structure. Even though you might have to fall in line with their corporate blissful policies and programs, uh, they are starting to, as the old guard turns over, the mission is changing and the investment in, in labor and, and talent is changing too. So uh, don't just think about research funding, yeah. thinking about getting inside the beast and changing it from the inside out. So going down to Wendy. <laughs> also with the advent of uh, technology and the internet, there is more and more control over funding from you guys and you're probably not even aware of it. Crowdfunding has become a big thing. I mean, just like you can vote with your wallet for products, you know, I want non-GMO or I want this or I want that, by simply buying what you prefer. Now, um, there are all these project sites online that are available where the general public can fund what they want to see happen. It's like, you know, I'm going to donate $5 to this, and when a million people do that, you suddenly have something funded. And uh, you can pick. Wasn't kidding about passing the hat. We'll just do it in the digital <laughs> space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, you've been waiting patiently. So here comes the mic up front. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and we're, we're, we're wrapping up here, so we'll take uh, this question and then we'll wrap it up, actually. And then folks can talk with these folks, whoever's, I don't know who's got the next plane ride. Thank you. Um, what are some of the best methods that you have seen for getting academic and scientific information down to end users so that they can take action on it? Um, I think uh, one thing to do is if you're, if you're working on a local basis instead of kind of global questions, that's a, that's a good case study for getting involved <coughs> with the people in that region, whether you're a scientist or a policymaker or a rancher or a farmer. And uh, uh, the important thing, though, I think, is that conversation needs to happen before the work's begun. So it needs to be a dialogue or, you know, multiple dialogues between many different stakeholders to figure out. I'm, so I'm a scientist, and um, it's important for me to understand the rancher's perspective because I want to set up experiments and my research questions that will give them the information that they need. And so in order to know that, I have to talk to them first. So I mean, just building those relationships, which takes time, building those relationships with people, um, doing things like this, where we all come from very different disciplines, and just getting together and talking about those issues can really take you leaps and bounds uh, versus if you were just working on those yourself. Uh, we're probably working on 400 participatory projects now, where it's community-based conservation, community-based restoration, community-based food production, alternative energy projects, soil carbon projects, uh, getting engaging people in the process of conversation. Uh, we just did something. Uh, my wife is the president of a new watershed partnership and did something called uh, Places of the Heart. And if you, I'll, I'll, ex I'll describe it in a second here. Quickly. Uh, a map of the watershed and each person that came in, it was about 200 people that came into a meeting. They were given little pink stick on hearts and they put those hearts on places. They were asked to put them on the, on the aerial photographs and the maps on places that were meaningful to them. And then we had a conversation about why that meaning was out there on the landscape. And it broke down every single barrier I, I would have imagined to be present. You know, the, the wealthy people, the big farmers were there, the, the little farmers, the, the people that had hunting dogs that hunt raccoons at night, run across anybody's property. Uh, and all of a sudden, people started having a conversation about how they can work together and about what was meaningful uh, about place. And so participatory process starts, in my opinion, before the, science, before the science work is laid out, and then the people actually help, uh, are engaged in helping do the science, citizen science, uh, along with a layer of professional science, really begins to inform everybody, in our opinion. So 
wonderful process. So I'm going to I'm going to wrap it up. Anybody want to add to that on on the panel? Just uh, just a quick comment. I think um, the participatory science and uh, in, um, interactive uh, learning, peer peer to peer learning, is the model that we've really been using in Texas in some areas. The traditional model was, you know. Researcher gives the information to the extension guy, the extension guy goes and gives it to the farmer, top-down type of approach. But really, that's not the way that people learn and adopt new practices. They learn much better from each other, from people that they know, that they respect, and that they kinetically interact with some of the things we're doing with fire. People go out there and burn the land together, and it's an exciting event, and people really get engaged, and <laughs> next thing is, we're going to come burn your place next week. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. All right. So, so now, we've come together to think about research, and I'm having an idea about our research, and I've, I know uh, Jenny's back. So the idea of interviewing the ranchers before we even do science, like getting to know them first, ha seems to be essential. And our work is about social science and natural science, so that seems like just a no-brainer now that you said it. So smart. It's like a duh. And, um, and so that, that's really cool. So, Obviously, this subject, we could talk about it for days, we just have, and um, we're going to continue doing this work, so we'll figure out a way to keep communicating as we make progress with our research. Is it possible to get a show of hands just to see what the backgrounds of the people are here? Would that be a possibility? Go for it. We got How many people here are academics at the university? How many people are students from the university? How about local community, just citizens? Uh, politicians and regulators? One, um, two. How, how about farmers? That's my last name, but it's not my name. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Something's got lost. What he just said was farmers is last name. Something got lost in the translation yeah. there. How um, many want to be farmers that aren't farmers yet? A couple? How many are involved in uh, voting your dollars and in investing locally in food systems? How many are looking for that connection to place, that connection to community? How many are looking for that way to, to contribute to some of the problems we've been talking about? Okay. All right. It's good. Um, I'm, 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 I'm wired. Oh, you are wired. Yeah. So, um, Get this away from me. Yeah, exactly. Wired. <laughs> so, so that wraps up uh, the Carbon Nation conversation number four about soil carbon. And I want to thank everybody on this panel for coming here. and the other six scientists who've left to get planes and things like that. And in I'll spirit. In spirit. I want to thank the Global Institute of Sustainability and the School of Sustainability for supporting this ongoing series of conversations. And I want to thank the Walton Initiative for supporting this particular gathering, this CONFAB as we've called it, the Soil Carbon CONFAB. Thank you for being here and uh, stay tuned for the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good stuff. Good.